Welcome everyone, I'm Dr. Michael Pierce. Today I have Dr. David Helfand. We are talking today about the types of things you can do with your metabolism for counseling. So David, I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us what you do and what, what type of work you can offer to our study. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for having me join. And I I wish that the I could join the worldwide group on a regular basis, but alas, uh, you know, all of our schedules, it's it's hard to it's hard hard to get everyone to match up here. So I'm a licensed psychologist. I specialize in couples therapy retreats as well as brain mapping. And I came into this world through the lens of neurofeedback. My dissert, my dissertation was in neurofeedback. And then pretty quickly, I started realizing that the systemic process needed to be addressed. So I remember um, having someone in my office who had insomnia and we did neurofeedback, I did CBT, we did sleep hygiene, and just, it wasn't working. And I, I very vividly remember the session, sitting her down in the black leather chair over there and saying, all right, let's redo the intake. And I just started asking questions. Long story short, turns out that she did not like her bed partner. And I went, aha. <laughs> and then that was the the foyer into doing more of the couples and systemic work. And it just, it's been taken off ever since. Oh, that's good. So, so what you can offer our group is that you have uh, background and experience in counseling and in neurofeedback and couples therapy and workshops. Your, your, your claim to fame and, and your website is very well organized about doing couples workshops that are actually live and people must come to you. They don't do this online. They come to you live and do workshops. Is that correct? That is correct. So it's a national business, although international, if you include Canada and some other some other local areas ish. And uh, so people fly to me and I work with them one couple at a time. And we work on communication as the foundation of the couple's work. I tell people, just like your brain, your relationship will reinforce the state you put it in. Most couples come to me because they've become really good at arguing with each other. And my job is to teach you to actually communicate in a way that builds a connection, improves your sex life, uh, helps your parenting styles, you know, whatever it might be. And so, you know, similar to other couples therapy uh, practices out there, I, you know, want to teach people a foundation of skills, but I also want them to be talking to each other. And that's where I find the brain mapping is really helpful. So just a quick example of that, you know, I do a, um, I did a brain map on a couple a uh, few months ago now. One of them had a fast processing speed. So their PDR was around 12 Hertz, if I remember correctly, 11.9 or so. And the, um, the other partner had a slowing near Wernicke's area. So they were having trouble processing information. So you can imagine if you have one person that's like a Ferrari and one that's like an old Corolla, <laughs> it's, there's going to be a mismatch. And so, you know, what I really love doing with the brain mapping, I love neurofeedback. It's, it's been a major part of my practice for years. I can't do neurofeedback in a three-day intensive with couples. So what I find myself doing is the brain map and then giving them neurofeedback protocols, pointing them to ISNR for local support, but then also writing down the lifestyle recommendations and how their neurology might be playing off each other to impact their relationship. And of course, what they can do to improve that. Marvelous. And, and tell us what city are you in? So I'm currently in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Uh, it's about two and a half hours north of Logan International in Boston. So it's it's convenient for couples because they take one road for like 120 miles. Mm. And what's your website? So currently it's lifewisevt.com. However, I would encourage people to start checking out marriagequest.org. My parents actually have the number one couples retreat center in the United States. And I am slowly going to be joining their practice, we'll say. Um, they are, they've been doing it for many, many years. David, that is marvelous. Thank you so much. Um, well, um, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. What we're talking about today is couples issues and the nuts and bolts behind different things that could affect how couples relate to each other. Uh, I tend to be, as you know, the nuts and bolts chemistry guy. I talk about brain chemistry. I talk about food and I talk about the, uh, the mechanisms underlying some of these things that, that, that can seem pretty strange and pretty weird. But there's some pretty cool explanations as to why some things might get in the way of couples relating. So what we're going to do is go through some questions and, and answers, and comments, and have a discussion here. Um, my guest again for you that have just joined is David Helfand. And so we are going to launch right into that. Uh, David, go right ahead. 
Sure. So actually, I'd like to pose the first question to you, Michael, since you have a very in-depth knowledge of blood sugar. And so the first question I'd like to tackle is the relationship between blood sugar and bickering in a couple. And uh, I know we've spoken about this offline. So what, what thoughts do you have to, uh, to help people in their relationships? Yeah, I mean, if, if you have a loving person that you like to be with and, and you sometimes turn into a bear, there can be a couple of reasons for that. You know, one is, is hypoglycemia and one is insulin resistance, which is hyperglycemia or too much blood sugar. So the person can be um, you know, very grumpy and very, very sullen, very, very uh, irritated. And then they eat something and they feel better. That's the typical hypoglycemic. And so they're not a very good, they're not a very fun partner. On the other hand, you can have insulin resistance, which is where you go along and you're feeling pretty good and you don't really get that hungry and you don't really get that hangry. But then when you eat a meal, you have insulin resistance. And so your body slows down and you get that sudden wall. You want to take a nap and you want to sleep. And, um, and then you feel kind of lethargic and thick and heavy and you just feel like, oh, I, you know, I, I ate a you know, I, I ate a mattress or something. And, and that, that very commonly is what people feel like. It can happen at night, it can happen during the day. So either profile, can really mess up relationships and, and relating. So there's a scientific reason between hangry hurting couples relationships. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Some people have to eat more often and some people have to eat more minerals and some people have to stabilize their blood sugar. You've got to do some lab tests to find out in some cases. You can experiment, um, but uh, some, some people have to dive in and really look at chemistry. Hmm. So I wonder if you have any suggestions for couples that might find themselves in this experience where they work really long shifts. You know, I'm thinking of our, the nurse professionals, doctor, medical, you know, the medical professionals out there that, you know, are 12 hours on, they sometimes get a lunch break, maybe they're wolfing down their food, and then they come home, their partner wants to see them and hang out with them because they haven't seen them for a while, and then they get into a fight immediately. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really a problem. If a person can adapt to fasting or, or intermittent fasting, which means going eight hours without food, that can be really good. But for Americans, it takes a long time to learn how to do that if you're new to it. Um, it requires mineral supplementation with trace minerals. It requires a phase of eating more fats and getting fat adapted and getting used to eating more fats and oils. And it, and it takes sometimes eating every couple of hours. So a person may not be able to start out with intermittent fasting. They may have to start out with snacking every two hours or, or in, in some cases, if they can't, they might have to snack before they get home. You know, you, you may be waiting, waiting to have that wonderful time with your with your companion, but you can't do it because, you know, you, you, you want to wait and eat with them. But you might do better if you eat a little snack before you have your meal with them after that eight hour shift. I think that's great. One other thing I would add to that, because I do a lot of sex therapy, is maybe consider having the snack off your partner. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. That's a great idea. So something else I just want to add to this is I think um, in those moments where people are feeling really emotional and maybe they feel themselves crashing, it's probably going to take some time to develop the self-awareness to know what's going on. So if people are listening to this and thinking like, well, what can I do initially just to help the relationship? I usually tell people to just say what you're feeling. You know, people all ask me all the time, well, what do I do when I get defensive? Say I'm feeling defensive. And then you can move from there to the next parts of the, uh, you know, the process. Oh yeah, it's it's quite releasing for a couple to be able to identify and admit to each other. I'm feeling hangry. I'm just it's a blood sugar. Then you can blame it on something else because a lot of times it is something else. It isn't a fundamental issue. I think that's one of the big things is sometimes it isn't a fundamental issue. It's pain. It's aching. It's you know, stuff we'll get to as we talk here. It's it's all kinds of other issues. It isn't just I'm sick of you. <laughs> yeah, I I completely agree. So um so David, we were talking about restful sleep. How <laughs> how can restful sleep lead to peaceful relationships so similar to what we were just saying about being hangry and and blood sugar what i find is that sleep is one of the best indicators of overall nervous system health and you have to be a relatively well functioning individual to then be in a relationship so if you are going to you know, in, if you're going to spend quality time together and be fully engaged and present, you're going to have to have the right state of mind, literally, both emotionally, literally, biochemically, all of it. And so what I see from a lot of couples is they tend to want more quality time from each other, but one person is just totally exhausted. And it, it's going to change the feeling you have when you're with each other. Similarly, if you're not getting good sleep and you wake up in the morning like a big grouchy pants, 
then that's going to impact your relationship as well. I'm I'm reminded of someone that I did some neurofeedback with years ago who he said, like, don't talk to me until lunch. And I said to him, listen, that's not going to work. <laughs> you can't just hit snooze on your relationship till 12 o'clock. That's not going to be healthy. <laughs> so we did some neurofeedback. We did some other work around sleep. And basically, he was able to get to the point of, listen, when I wake up, I need an hour to just sort of get myself going. And, and his wife thought, OK, that's reasonable. So we gave them the hour and then they were able to sort of have a morning check-in date with each other. They didn't have kids. That's a whole other category. <laughs> and, um, and then they, you know, continued about their day, but they started in the morning with that connection, which was so profound. And the other part about sleep that's really significant is the routines you have around sleep. If you and your partner go to bed at different times, I know some people think that's a doom sentence for your marriage. Not necessarily though. I, I often go to bed earlier than my wife. She tends to be more of a night owl for a variety of reasons. And so we've developed a, a system where, you know, she'll just come and kind of tuck me in bed or we'll talk for a few minutes. And then I'll say, okay, sweet dreams. I'm, I'm going to go to sleep and you can go do your cross stitching or your, your audio, your audible books, or, you know, whatever you're going to do, but it just creates a routine around it, even though we have different circadian rhythms. That's good. I know plenty of couples that are, you know, one of them is a is a morning person and the other one is a night night owl and and, and they can they can make it work. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense. I have to say, if if somebody did come to me and tell me that it took them an hour or two to wake up, I would have to I would have to ask them about their adrenals. I would have to say, um, man, you know, we've got something called the the cortisol awakening response or the CAR, and it's supposed to be that it, that most people should be able to wake up within 30 minutes of, of becoming conscious and, and be human. And if it takes more than 30 minutes, it's a medical kind of condition that has to do with the adrenal dysfunction. So I would want to do saliva testing or urine testing and look at their adrenal hormones and say, we might need to fix this. 30 minutes is reasonable, but 60 minutes is a little bit much. And they may have an adrenal issue where their adrenal glands need restoration um, regarding how they communicate with their brain. So I would, I would just want to throw that out there too. I think that's great. And I think this speaks to the importance of a multidisciplinary approach, right? The, uh, what's the saying to, uh, to a boy with, to a boy with a hammer, the world is a nail, right? <laughs> so we just kind of see it through our lens, but it's important. And one of the reasons that, you know, I think we're doing these videos is to have a multidisciplinary perspective. And I think that's a great addition. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to blame the person for taking an hour to wake up, but sometimes you don't know you have something going on, you know, um, um, we have an epidemic of insulin resistance and adrenal problems in the United States, and thyroid problems. And the more we know about it, the more we can do something about it because it's preventable and reversible. And, and to add to that, if that's your norm, you might not even know that it's abnormal, right? Or, yeah. or not healthy. I mean, there's a difference between something being normal and being healthy, right? Because as you mentioned, there's an epidemic in, in many ways in the U.S. with nutrition and gut health and, I mean, sleep, relationships, all the things we're talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'd like to uh, move us to the always sexy topic, Michael, of bowel movements and relationships. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, uh, I, I think this is a really, a really big problem. This can, this can affect um, uh, erectile dysfunction. This can affect libido. This can affect a person's, even, even their, their breath can be affected by what toxics toxins are held within their colon and how long their colon holds toxins, how constipated a person might be, what kind of dysbiosis might happen. Um, a person can have, you know, rather foul breath from, from processing carbohydrates. We can end up with methane or hydrogen breath. We can end up with flatulence. We can end up with just all kinds of problems that make us really unappealing as a bed partner. And so um, I think, uh, Bowel function is really important. Dysbiosis, which is the, the balance of bacteria in the gut and the ability to have predictable, regular, reasonable bowel movements um, is really related to food and it can affect relationships and intimacy. When we're looking at the issues of bowel function, it is very important to understand that not everybody's bowels smell the same and they don't need to smell the same, but the general concept is healthy people and healthy children generally don't have horrible, awful bowel movements. And I know this may sound crazy, coming from a doctor who works with people that have carnivore diets. But I'm telling you that if you feed humans meat, they don't have terribly awful bowel movements when they're, when they're, when they're doing things right. And when they're balanced, when they have lots of fat in their diet, when they have lots of animal products in their diet, they do fine. So um, if a person has a really smelly 
bowel movement or they have really bad gas or they have really bad flatulence, uh, farting, it may be a sign that something is off. And it usually is a sign that something's off because people just don't stink. They really don't. And if they've got really bad body odor, if they've got really bad underarm odor, if they've got bad breath, if they've got smelly foot syndrome, which is actually a thing, it's, it's a thing that is involved in children uh, before they grow up enough to actually have true body odor and underarm hair. It's, it's a pre-developmental thing that happens in pre-adolescence. It usually is zinc deficiency, by the way. It, this is something that um, we really need to look at. So, so we want to pay attention to these odors. We want to identify mouth odors that might come from rotten teeth or bad bacteria in the gums versus what's coming up from the stomach. You can have an absolutely clean mouth that's meticulously clean and the odor comes from, from maldigestion in your stomach or it comes from maldigestion in your small intestine, bile, and, and large intestine. So all those, those odors should be investigated and we shouldn't blame these people and just deodorize them with some chemical spray um, or, or give them, you know, um, uh, just deodorants uh, that are below the belt deodorants or, or that are underarm deodorants or, or mouth deodorants. We should seek to find the root cause. It's amazing how whenever something goes wrong in a, another region where the sun don't shine, we just want to kind of cover it up, right? We don't talk about it. It's just, nope, nope, that's, that's just for you to deal with. And um, you know, it reminds me of when you and I were talking a while ago, I think in preparation for this, we were using the metaphor of, you know, if you're driving down the interstate and you're looking at a car in front of you that's just spewing black smoke, everyone sort of understands like, okay, that person needs to stop at the nearest mechanic. That, that's not good. But we don't think about that in terms of our own body. You know, our bowel movements are spewing black smoke often frequently, and we just go, all right, flush it. Let's forget about it. <laughs> Let's move on with our day. But like that needs to be addressed. And I think, you know, you you shared a story with me about how you used to, in a, I believe it was a residential facility, you used to actually look at people's bowel movements and then make some assessments and say, hey, based on this, here are some dietary things we should talk about or uh, stress management or, you know, whatever it might be. And I wish that was part of every physical. I mean, it's amazing to me that, it's not. And if you just ask somebody, well, what are your bowel movements like? They're probably not going to give an answer that's clinically relevant. They're going to say, oh, you know, I poop twice a day or once a day or, or you know, oh, yeah, it's, you know, the same as it's always been. Well, maybe they have always had problems. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, the way that people, the mechanics of the way that Americans go to the bathroom is that they will use the toilet paper and cover up the stool before they can even see it. So by the time they get up and look at the, at the toilet, it's covered with paper. So they don't really get a chance to see it. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's actually something we did at our facility. We had a retreat center where people stayed in residence, slept there, and, and had you know, showers and toilets and bathrooms and beds, and, and they slept there for weeks at a time. And so over time, we, we started realizing, hey, we need to look at the children's bowel movements, and then we need to look at the adults' bowel movements. And so we started to you know, do everything from taking pictures of the bowel movements to just looking at them and inspecting them and, and kind of talking them through. And what does this mean? What does each kind of bowel movement look like? And that's, that's a discussion for another time, but you're right. That's a very important discussion to have for everyone. Everyone needs to, to understand what their bowel movements mean and, and what's normal and, and what's not normal for their diet. Well, I'm just imagining an intern at that facility, looking at uh, all the pictures laid out for the client's uh, formulation session. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I was a, I was an early doctor and I was, I was fresh out of school and I was, you know, pretty low man on the totem pole. So one of my jobs and we all, our jobs were rotated. One of the jobs was cleaning the toilets. And so we had a, a you know, a, a public toilet and, and um, with a bunch of stalls. And so you're cleaning the toilet and you're wondering how come all these toilets aren't the same? How come I have to scrub some of them differently than others? And, um, and you know, you would start to wonder, well, does it have to do with our guests? And does it have to do with our guests' chemistry and health? And that's, that led down a, a long road that, that, that was very helpful. Interesting. It's amazing how uh, certain conclusions are formed and uh, the accidental discoveries that shape the world, right, Michael? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So I imagine this is a very complicated topic. I mean, your GI system is, is very intricate and very nuanced, I would imagine very individualized for many people, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what would you typically recommend someone start with if they are constipated? And it might also be worth defining constipation because I think there's a, a, some misconception about that. 
Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's hard because um, the American system really allows for a lot of variability of bowel movements and constipation in <clears throat> the gastrointestinal world. And, and, and we're kind of alternative. So um, there's, there's some, some differences about that. The, the system tends to say in, in orthodox medicine that whatever your normal is, is normal. And, and there's a few different classifications that we have to go all the way to Britain for to understand what different types of stools look like and are classified like. But the general mm. concept is people should typically have a bowel movement every day if they're eating every day. And, um, and, and I think one of, the, one of the biggest problems is that if a person feels incomplete emptying, that can be a sense of constipation where they get a very pasty or very heavy stool and they can't get it all out. And so that will give a person a sense that they didn't completely empty. And that usually is, is a real um, poor digestion. There, there's undigested protein in there and there's some problems that may even come from fiber. We've all been taught that fiber is our savior. And for some people, fibers and lectins can be a real problem. And so it, may, it can take them a number of weeks to achieve balance by doing an, an, an elimination diet <clears throat> to identify which fibers are bad for them because not all fiber is good. We're taught in America that, you know, um, uh, different kinds of fiber like, um, soluble and insoluble fiber is just always good. Just pile more fiber on and you'll be fine. Just eat oats and eat, eat more fiber and take fiber supplements and you'll be great. Well, there's a bunch of authors that, that say not necessarily do that. So it's, it's worth exploring. Yeah. So I, I imagine myself, like other people that might've been to the doctor have said, you know, I feel a little constipated and I'm wondering, you know, what you'd recommend. And I'm sure you and I could spend a whole hour talking about modern medicine and Western medicine in, in its own session. But the advice that I got that I think a lot of other people have probably heard is, well, you know, take the supplement, take Metamucil, take, you know, whatever it is to kind of soften the stool and make it work. Um, I, I imagine a lot of people already might know the answer to this question that are, since I'm raising it, but is that a substitute for working on the fiber intake or proteins or other dietary options? Well, Metamucil is another fiber. So if I'm if I'm looking to give somebody better bowel movements, I, I may give them something like, you know, raw watermelon or watermelon juice, or I may give them magnesium supplements. Um, I may give them sodium because people that are, like, I tend to do a lot of carnivore diets and a lot of low carb diets, which require about twice as much sodium, which just blows people's mind to think that, my God, I have to double my sodium consumption. Yeah, actually, sodium consumption is safe and it moves the bowels when a person does a low carb diet and eats more meat. But bear in mind, it could take weeks for a person to get rid of all the lectins and all the fibers that might be causing dysbiosis and gas production in their, in their bowels. So that's that's some more specific advice. Yeah. So I think this is great info. Just to add to it, you know, we talked about how it impacts your relationship specifically. And again, I do a lot of sex therapy with couples. So from what I've seen more on the mechanical side, what a lot of men don't realize is that erectile issues can largely be caused by uh, muscle tension. And there's this feeling that when you tense up, you're kind of sustaining yourself sexually, but it's actually cutting off blood flow. And what I see for a lot of men is that if they are constipated, they might be unknowingly clenching, they might be nervous about farting when they're in bed because they're, they haven't completed a bowel movement. And so then they're actually holding their muscles and their pelvic floor, which is going to then cause more issues, sexually speaking. And so I think this is a great example of where people aren't putting the pieces together. They might say, oh, I'm not sexually performing. Um, and so I'm going to go take this pill or go try these other you know, things. But if it's related to, if you also have concurrent GI issues, you might want to start with that, with some of the advice you're giving. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, the, the whole, um, the whole pelvic floor and the prostate is really uh, subject to the tone of the of the bowel, which is right next to the prostate. So we're really supposed to have a bolus of of um, you know waste matter go through and then relax and nothing. So we have this intermittent bowel movement, then nothing. We shouldn't have this constant state of tension of trying to push some kind of bowel movement through. And so um, um you know like we talked about magnesium and, and other other raw fruits and things and, and sodium that's used to try to get that going. Not always fiber, but sometimes fiber. And then I think um, important for that too is, is uh, zinc and vitamin E. Zinc and vitamin E are extremely important for prostate function and for the ability to have arousal in both male and female bodies. Uh, it's, it's very important to understand that, that it's not just men that need zinc and vitamin E. It, it, it can both, both be true for women. 
So Michael, I'd like to ask you another question on nutrition and uh, relationships. And specifically, this is more related to just uh, mental focus and how that, you know, how uh, some of the common elements of our diet in, in the West might impact that. And I'm curious to talk about how food additives and artificial sweeteners can impact irritability, impact focus, or maybe other mental performance. Well, it's a it's a good question. There's a very famous uh, hero of mine. I've got a, I've been collecting heroes for the last 30 years in medicine, and um, his name is Russell Blaylock. He's a he's a uh, neurosurgeon, and he wrote a book called Excitotoxins. And Excitotoxins, they talk about MSG and NutraSweet and other types of, of sweeteners because there's many many more now. And, and they're excitotoxins. Essentially, what they do is they toxify the brain and make it fire excessively. So if you've got um, either one or both members of a couple. And, and they, they just, their brain is always firing or they have excess beta waves or excess activation. They're not going to be able to come down and meet the other person at a, at a level that makes sense. They're just going to be uh, on fire like a, like, a, like a hair trigger. So it's very important to avoid those foods. And it can take days and weeks for them to, to, to titrate out of the body after you've eaten them. They, they, they hang around for a long time, especially in children. Wow. So... I, this you know makes me think of just the epidemic of ADHD that we see in our culture, and I've seen many studies come out. And for people that are brain mapping, that listen to this and do their own brain mapping, you're probably seeing more of that frontal slowing, and the theta beta ratio is really off. I've even heard that the theta beta ratio has to be adjusted now based on how many people are coming in with a an off ratio, and I, it sounds to me like a big part of that could be just access to food. I mean, there's plenty of people that can't afford to go organic, plenty of people that can't uh, have, they don't have access to maybe good quality foods in their neighborhood. I think to some extent, New England is fortunate to have such, uh, you know, pretty large preponderance of farmer's markets and yeah. you know, all these different stores, you can kind of get whatever foods you want. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, do you have any, tips for people that, I mean, certainly McDonald's is its own category, <laughs> but for people that are struggling to figure out like, well, what are in the foods that I'm eating and, and how do I even start to approach this topic? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think we need databases of EEGs and ERPs, brain maps that are on healthy people with healthy diets. I, I think that we're allowing the slippage into a, a really bad uh, idea that we're, we're measuring brain waves and we're saying that this is normal and we're letting it slide. So I think we need to look at GMOs. We need to look at, at organic food. We need to look at pesticides. There were recent studies that have just come out that showed that school lunches were full of pesticides like glyphosate and heavy metals and that our water is full of heavy metals and, and fluoride. We, we have really no excuse to keep fluoride in the water. We've got to get it out. It's just, a, it's, it's over. The issue has been beaten to death. Finally, children lose over seven IQ points just from consuming fluoridated water. So we've got to we've got to get this this revolution in food and, and, and get a get a back to baseline of what is healthy relationships based on what you eat and what you don't eat, what you don't put in your body. And the other part of this that I think is really significant is that I, I believe I, I'm not sure of the exact author, maybe you know, that there's some research that when kids grow their own food or are part of that process, they're more likely to eat vegetables and try other foods. Whereas if you just put spinach in front of a kid or, or pea pods, they're probably not going to eat it. But if they get to see it grow and they're watering it each day, it really becomes a, a powerful introduction to how do you, you know, grow these healthy foods. And that's a big part of how I would encourage couples to approach it as well. That if you can have a little greenhouse over in the side or you know, some of these, um, you know, what's the term for those, the, the structure, the towers that you can have in your home now and you put a Oh, yeah. 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 I don't know what that's called, but yeah, the, the in, inside, inside um, greenhouses. Yeah. 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 So things like that, I think, first of all, it's really good quality time for families and couples. If you have kids, it's really important to introduce them to vegetables. They, you know, this idea of like, I mean, who wants to eat Popeye's spinach, right? That looks disgusting. But like fresh spinach from a garden that you make a salad or a quick saute with some garlic, like it's really delicious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think you're talking about Rudolf Steiner. Um, I, I lectured in Sweden a number of years ago and they they showed me an incredible school system over there, how in, in, in Southern and even Northern Sweden, they had had this whole system of growing food and serving food. And, and it was amazing how the children ate. 
Yeah, yeah. And I mean, worst case scenario, they get some gardening skills, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And spend a little more time together. Gosh, well, yeah, David, sure. um, I would like to ask you, can you tell me a little bit about how a healthy relationship can be a good prevention for heart disease? Absolutely. So it's amazing how a relationship, a healthy marriage has so many tendrils into other part of our nervous system. So let's just take a quick example. If you're stuck in traffic and you're just swearing at the cars around you, everyone probably understands that's not, that's not good for your health, right? You get a rush of cortisol, adrenaline. It's actually been shown that being stuck in traffic and getting really angry is about the equivalent of smoking one cigarette just the amount of damage that it does to your nervous system. And there is a plaque that builds up in your bloodstream. When that plaque rushes through your heart, it can build up on the inside, which eventually can break off and cause, cl uh, cause clotting and other issues throughout your body. So most people understand that kind of stress is bad. Now, take that situation into a marriage and into your household. If you come home and the first thing you do is swear, scream, or avoid your partner, because maybe that's your style of confrontation is avoidance, it's going to have a similar effect. So for some reason, we've all understood and we've all kind of accepted, okay, the angry people, the angry CEO at your office or the you know disgruntled coworker is that's going to impact their health outcomes, but we haven't made the transition or the translation to, well, coming home and yelling at your spouse or your kids is the same thing. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure spikes. It's going to cause similar health issues down the road. So learning how to co-regulate with your partner is going to improve your marriage. It's going to improve your own health. And by the way, it's going to improve your kids' outcomes as well. So, you know, there's this great quote from, I'm forgetting the author, but the book is called Simple Parenting. This is a great mm. quote about how your kids are the least likely to do what you say, but the most likely to copy what you do. <laughs> and so if you can model that behavior, then it's going to have major impacts for the, everyone in the home. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I can imagine that even even maintaining healthy boundaries can be difficult for some people because as they as they seek that balance and they come home from work if they feel they have to enforce some boundaries they might find that they're you know feeling like gosh am i am i too too forceful or am i not forceful enough i've got to enforce my boundaries and, and establish them but i've also got to be nice and and not dump on everybody at home like my boss does <laughs> it's true i mean so i tell couples transitions are the most likely time for an argument because during any kind of transition you are not thinking about the relationship or really analyzing it deeply you're thinking about the next thing you know i have to come home and cook dinner i have to come home and now i have to clean the whole living room so what i tell people is just give yourself a slower transition if you know that coming home you tend to get irrit irritable then just Pull over to the side of the road and stare at the mountains or the park or a tree or a squirrel and just take 10 minutes. You know, it takes about um, the half life of adrenaline is about five minutes. So if you are coming from a really stressful day, you need to give yourself at least five to 10 minutes. 15 is ideal to really settle your nervous system before walking through that door to your supposable loved ones that you care about. <laughs> that makes sense. That, that really makes sense. <laughs> Michael, I had another question for you, if I can get you back in the spotlight for a minute. So as I've mentioned a couple of times through this series, I work a lot with sex therapy and um, a lot of couples coming in need to discuss their sex life. And I'd love your take on how proper nutrition can impact or improve someone's sex life. Gosh, it's it's so important. I think I think um, the, the biggest piece in American culture today is insulin resistance. I think the, the bombing of carbohydrates of our systems creates so much hormone dysregulation that it really does play havoc with our sex lives and our, our libido, our desire, and our, our ability to be desired, and feel desirable, our ability to control our weight and, and our water balance throughout our body and to feel attractive um, and to have good hormones and, and good responses to hormones and good rest and recovery. So my first advice would be to really throw out the old idea that fat is bad and carbohydrates are good. We've been accepting that since the 1950s. Um, and, and we really need to get back to the idea that we've got to lower our carbs and increase our healthy fats. And even saturated fat is not a bad thing as long as we've got our carbs under control. And uh, so that's that's why I tend to use a lot of low carb, ketogenic and, and 
and carnivore-ish type diets. Not terribly strict ones, but ones that just nudge us away from the carbohydrates, the grains, the nuts, the seeds, the beans. Um, even though those are in some ways good foods, too much of them can be a real problem for balance of hormones. And they mess up um, men and women. They mess up every every gender combination that you can find. The chemistry is, is destructive no matter what um, no matter what uh, chemistry is happening in you um, from, from a spectrum of, of, of super male to super female, all of the hormone spectra are affected. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really good advice. And, you know, I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking of stories of people saying, well, you know, some of my best sexual experiences were we, we went out on a date, we went to a pizza place, had some wine and went back and Yahoo. Right. So yeah. I'm also wondering I would imagine this process changes based on age as well, that when you're in your teens and 20s, maybe your system can handle certain things that when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond become more difficult. Yeah, it's true. People have to be careful with their tolerance level and find a tolerance level because it does change. The immune system changes, your your tolerance changes, your need for sleep changes, your exercise changes. Um, and, um, and of course, how much of these lectins that you eat, you know, if you eat a, a one piece of pizza, you might feel like a champion, but if you eat pizza all week, you might find that there's too much lectins in the wheat or in the cheese to affect your, your chemistry. And, and by two or three or four days in, you, you find that that food has affected your sex life and your, and your, your, your body. So, um, it's about tolerance. How much of something can I tolerate in a, in a certain given time frame? I, I can't eat very much wheat at all. Um, but I can, eat, I can have some, so it's not zero. If somebody gives me ice cream or a piece of, of cake for, for someone's birthday, I'll celebrate their birthday, but I'll have a tiny piece of cake and I won't have anything else like that for, for several days. Cause I just have a tolerance that I have to stop. It's just too much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had headaches for many years that went, uh, kind of unknown, you know, they call it, uh, was it idiopathic headaches <laughs> and yeah. I found out after doing an elimination diet and working with some other healthcare providers that uh, dairy was the culprit. And so, you know, kind of like you, I can have a little bit of dairy, but, you know, then I have to kind of take a break for five days and let my system clean out and, you know, do what it does. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. You know, as far as proper nutrition goes, I think something that I see with couples is that it's really helpful to have a conversation very openly about what your needs are. Because I have seen couples make the, the mistake of thinking they are doing something kind, but in reality, it's causing temptation or maybe other issues even. So great yeah. example of this is, you know, showing up to the office with a, a pile of donuts or some cookies or, you know, you come home and say, honey, I just baked a fresh pie and, you know, the your partner might feel pressured to eat those. They might even just want to eat them, but in reality, they shouldn't. And so having that open communication can be really helpful. And I recommend doing it proactively. Just sit down sometime, once a year even, and just talk about how has your diet been? What kinds of improvements are you trying to make? Um, and is there anything you know you need to be held accountable for and anything your partner can do to facilitate that process? Yeah, it's it's you have to enlist your partner's help in in, in avoiding the, the big things that you're trying to avoid. And, and you know, for me, it's it's dairy and and uh, grains. For other people, it might be something completely different, like nightshades or or beans or something. Who knows? But but yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And, and uh, I think uh, you've got to enlist your partners and even your coworkers' help. I find that I have to enlist my coworkers' help sometime and and be like. Um, you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I, I probably won't be having any of this or that when when these these parties come up or or I'll have a, or I'll have a tiny, a tiny mouthful. Please don't be offended by the fact that I I toast you with your a bite of birthday cake and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> don't give me that slice that's as big as a wedding, you know, because they do that. They want to give you this giant slice of, of you know, birthday cake and and I, I won't do it. I just can't. I really can't. I know. I know. My my wife found a recipe on my birthday uh, maybe five years ago now for a vegan cheesecake that the crust is uh, waltz, uh, walnuts and dates, and then the actual filling itself is a chez. So it's a cashew cheese product that's totally dairy free and it. It sets in the freezer and oh man, that is delicious. <laughs> Boy, that, that sounds fantastic, man. Boy, uh, absolutely. Well, David, can I ask you about our last question here? Please. 
All right. So um, we have uh, questions from the audience that have come in. This is one that says, I'm worried I'm not attracted to my partner's smell or taste anymore. And I must say, I've seen this in my practice too. Uh, people, people are very confused by this and they bring it up to their doctors. Is there anything I can do um, when, when I'm not attracted at, or, or it seems like my, my preferences or my partner's um, uh, body has changed the way they smell? Um, something has shifted and I don't like it anymore. And I used to. Sure. So this could be its own 45 minute lecture or more, I think, but let's, let's try to distill it down to a couple minutes. And I can talk more about the, uh, you know, the relational process. And then I'd love to solicit your advice on any of the nutritional, you know, uh, suggestions, but the, the smell and taste of your partner is extremely important when it comes to sexual satisfaction and sexual intimacy and fulfillment. So there's been quite a bit of research on this and Part of what we know is that it's based in a lot of biology. So when you, your genetic code and your makeup partly dictate your T cell production and your T cell production, which is your immune response among a, many, a lot of other things, also dictates your smell. And that's important to know for a number of reasons. One is that we are biologically wired to find and be attracted to people that would create biodiversity in the gene pool. And so when you are finding a potential mate, you know, there's a lot of stories people have of like they walked by and I got a whiff of their hair and I went like, wow, you know, <laughs> or when you started being intimate with someone, you know, you wanted to provide oral sex all the time because it was just so exciting and pleasurable for the giver and the receiver. And that's that's very common early on. This gets complicated, though, because of a variety of issues. So one of them being uh, hormone levels with birth control, your birth control changes your T cell production, changes your biochemistry because it's essentially tricking the women's body into being in a different hormonal state to prevent pregnancy, which then is gonna change your taste and your smell. And so I see a lot of couples that were dating, they got married, and then the woman went off of birth control and now they're going, hey, I, the taste and smell is kind of different now. I'm, I'm confused. I used to really enjoy this, right? And now it's different. Um, so that's one thing to consider. I usually recommend both for the health of the woman and to sort of know what your, you know, your compatibility and, and your sense of connection with each other is at some point before you get married, go off birth control and just see what happens. And the other part of this that's significant is also typically a female cycle will change her scent and her smell as well. So during ovulation, during other periods of time, it's going to change. So one of the first things I say is, well, when was the last time you were attracted to your partner's scent and smell? And if people go, oh, well, even just like a few weeks ago, okay, this is probably just cyclical. And, you know, maybe you just need to work around that. Um, but then, of course, there's a whole lot else that goes into it for your diet. Um, I've seen a lot of people where they stress eat, that all the oil pours out of their system from having French fries and chicken wings and all of this. And now all of a sudden their, their sex life is not working the way that they want it to. And, you know, that can be for a lot of other reasons we've discussed in the previous videos of this series, but it also does impact people's uh, sense of taste and smell or their, oh, their, gosh. what they're giving off rather. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's, mm -hmm. it's very true. Um, I, I am, I'm, I'm so glad that this was a question that came up for us and, and, um, I think there's uh there's there's so much about this. You know, when you when you eat mustard or you drink beer, sometimes you'll notice that it comes out your palms and you can smell it, or it comes out of your face and, and your glands or around your mouth. There are there are you can actually smell that, and, and and even even dogs will do that. They'll come up to you and smell your face and, and smell what's coming out of your pores, and what's coming out of your forehead, or what's coming out of your your glands and your chin and your neck. So <clears throat> so. Sometimes a change in diet can make a big difference. Like you said, I think um, the adrenal stress is, is such a big deal. If a person is undergoing stress and they're, they're sweating an adrenal-based sympathetic sweat, it's a completely different sweat and it has much more odorous components to it. It's much more oily. It's much more odorous. If you go to the gym and work out and you just sweat water, you'll notice that your, your skin feels really watery. But if you have sweat from like being pulled over by a police officer, your sweat will be very, very oily. and You'll have that sense of, oh, man. And it also happens when you're hypoglycemic. If you're hypoglycemic, you'll feel your forehead sweat and you'll be like, wow, that's really oily sweat from the stress of cortisol being released to mobilize blood sugar. So it's really true. I'm, I want to say that if a, if a couple uh, finds themselves 
they used to be attracted to each other by smell. They probably have the something called the major histocompatibility complex, which is a part of molecules in your immune system that is what we what we essentially what we smell and, and understand of each other. And that's part of what makes us attracted to each other. And so chances are that didn't change because that doesn't change. But if you if you suddenly don't have it anymore and you lost it, you probably can get it back because it was true at one point. And since it doesn't change, it's probably something else. And that something else might be toxins, might be heavy metals, might be pesticides, might be solvents, might be um, um, uh, foods that are processed, the GMOs. So really cleaning up your life and cleaning up your diet might help you recover that attraction to the original major histocompatibility complex in the molecules of the immune system of your partner, which is what we smell. That's essentially what we smell. That's great, Michael. I, it reminds me of the research I've read on how uh, couples with an initial chemistry are more likely to stay together for the long term than couples that were kind of friends for a while and maybe said, hey, you know, we seem to be compatible. It was more intellectual. And I would wonder if they did a follow-up study based on what you're describing, if that's what they would find, that, that the molecules were sort of in sync with each other, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And those those T cells you talked about are really important. The One of the ways to strengthen T cell and T regulatory cell um, health is the fat-soluble vitamins, which are vitamins A, D, E, and K2. And those are things that we can all get from animal products and, and from fortified uh, vegetarian products. Very, very important for us to get to, to support those T cells that you mentioned. Yeah. So I think we should mention one other uh, related topic to this, which is, well, what if I just use a uh, perfume and cologne and, you know, under under body sprays and all these kinds of things. And I, I usually tell people, well, that's kind of like putting a mask on your partner before you kiss them. Like it is, it, I mean, it can have some, some advantage, right? Like if you just got off at the gym and you need to clean up and freshen and put on some deodorant before you then are intimate with your partner and you're okay with not showering first, you're both agreed on that, then, you know, sure, that makes sense to kind of freshen up. As a long-term solution though, it's probably one of these things where you're, you're bearing the symptoms and it's going to get worse over time without actually being addressed. Oh God, yes. The, the best thing for humans is the simplest soap. The, the simplest soap like Bronner's Castile soap or some other kind of bar soap that's very, very simple without fragrances. Because the FDA laws about fragrances and, and things are very, very sketchy with regard to perfumes. They don't have to say, they don't have to disclose the same things that they do for food on perfume and on body, uh, topical body things. So um, you might be putting stuff on yourself that's highly toxic and full of, of alien estrogens or called xenoestrogens. Um, you might be putting on um, petroleum-based chemicals. In fact, you probably are. If you don't understand the label and, and if, you're, if you're spraying something on you that you wouldn't eat, don't use it. Well, that's an interesting uh, idea. If you spray something on yourself, you wouldn't eat, you shouldn't use it. So for some reason, Michael, I feel like we keep coming back to this idea of what can you eat off your partner? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, I, I've got to say that the best thing to start with is, is, is clean soap. Soap mm -hmm. each other up, clean each other up, and then begin with the food and, and natural foods and organic foods and grass-fed foods and healthy stuff uh, as, as unprocessed as possible. doesn't mean that you shouldn't cook your food, but you don't want to cook it on each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, unless you're on a raw diet. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's a good one. Could you tell us a little bit more about the structure of what you offer in these workshops for the couples that come to you? You, you have one couple at a time, not multiple couples, right. one couple at a time. Now, tell us again about the structure. How many hours and how many days and what did they leave with? What's the aftercare? So it's um, typically it's a three day program. I do a one to four day program. You know, the one day is for premarital, really preventative work. Two day is really more just enhancement. They want to learn some skills and improve their marriage. Most couples that come to see me are in some level of crisis. And so the three-day program is really the minimum necessary amount. The, the four-day is an all-inclusive model where they get brain mapping. They get a um, HRV system to take home with them. And um, it's, it's usually a lot for couples. And so the three-day is tip, the more typical option. And I spend three hours each day with couples, one-on-one, -on -one, one couple at a time. And it's really geared to making sure they are moving in the direction that's going to achieve their goal. So for example, if they want to build an emotional connection and thereby improve their sex life and their co-parenting styles, then I make them talk to each other and I interrupt every time they say something that is moving them in the wrong direction. And then I coach them 
and provide real time feedback. Um, if somebody says, you know, for example, this comes up all the time where somebody says, I just need you to initiate sex with me more. And what I, I say to them, that's not what you want. What you want is to feel desirable, attractive, sexy. You want to feel like your partner's interested in you. And so when you say, hey, I want to feel more desirable and attractive, I want to know that I'm still sexy, then that's so much more personal and intimate than saying you need to approach me for sex. That's demanding. It's blaming. It's judgmental. It's the wrong message, even though the intent is very positive. So yeah. what, I, what I tell couples is at the end of the three-day program, you should have an instruction manual for your marriage so that mm. I give you a six to 12 month aftercare program where if you follow it, you are either going to improve your marriage or you're going to make the determination that you're no longer compatible with each other. But to be wow. honest, to be honest, Michael, most couples really are compatible. They just don't have the skills. No one has ever been taught how to be married. So, wow. I mean, imagine that, you know, the divorce rate's about 50%. Imagine that no surgeon ever went to school and 50% of their surgeries were successful. I would go, wow, that's absolutely incredible, right? Yeah, but yeah. But no one's ever taught how to how to do relationships. So, so this that's is, where- This is amazing. Uh, is it three hours continuous each day or is it three hours broken up each day? No, continuous three hours continuous. so that we can get momentum. We can really go deep into these topics. And then I assign homework and some scaffolding between the sessions. And sometimes the homework is sexual. Sometimes it's intellectual. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, just journaling to kind of get their thoughts out. And then we process that and deal with it the next day. Sure. Maybe sleep hygiene and stuff like that. Um, stress management. Good. Um, uh, tell me, how, how often do you meet with them in that 12, that six month aftercare span? So I, it's, there's no you know, follow-up that's included. They're welcome to meet with me if they're interested, but then we have to deal with licensing laws. So, right, okay. So, you, so know, you, give them, you give them a, a, you give them a physical manual to take home of, of, of written instruction for the next six months? So actually what I have them do is I dictate it and they write it down. I believe it's gotcha. more powerful for, gotcha. for people to take that one step of ownership and write it down yeah. themselves. Yeah. What's the general range of pricing for a couple that wants to do a retreat like this for a few days with you? And, and do they do it over the weekend so that they can, you know, um, come to you and then go back to work? Uh, do you offer that? Yeah, so I typically meet with couples during the week. Um, weekends, are uh, weekends are available for an additional fee. And, you know, generally speaking, the couples retreats, if you look at kind of national Pricing. It's around, you know, 2000 to about 10000 or slightly more for a couple's retreat for, you know, a few days. And I'm pretty much right in the middle of that. So the, the interesting part about pricing for a couple's retreat, though, is a lot of couples will say, oh, that's outside our price range or, you know, that's, you know, that's too much money for us to, right now. And certainly there are people with financial hardships where it is really hard to come up with that. And I totally understand. I, I respect that. Um, for people that have money sitting in their bank account, though, I want to remind you that the average cost of divorce is about $15,000 for attorney's fees. Then divide all of your marital assets in half. So it's amazing to me that people kind of understand like, OK, well, divorce is going to cost me, let's just say, $200,000 if you own an average home price. But, you know, we're not willing to we're not willing to risk five to ten thousand to actually save the marriage. And that mindset has got to change. I, I think, unfortunately, people are are more experienced with traditional couples therapy, where they might go for years and years, and it, it might work, it might not, they might have multiple therapists. This is not that model. Like, we are going to figure this out in three days. And it's a different mindset. It's a different way of doing the therapy. And it's, 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 it's apples and oranges, if, if you want to, you know, the old cliches. It's fascinating. And I, I think that if a, even if a couple was to learn definitively that they were not going to stay together, it'd be worth the money and the time. It is. About 40% of couples that get divorced report they regret it. And if they're getting divorced because of an affair, it's about 80%. And so wow, I didn't know having, that. having a definitive answer to are we compatible? Can we make this work is is worth a lot. And and, and let alone the skills that I'm teaching, one of the things I often say to couples is, you know, we're going to deal with your marriage in the first two days. We're going to deal with your relationship through the whole course of the treatment. 
Because if you have kids, you still need to have a relationship with each other. You might not like each other anymore. You might not lust each other at all, but you still have to have some respect for each other because your kids are going to be impacted. You know, we, there's this idea of divorce screwing up families. And by the way, if you're listening and you're thinking of getting a divorce, but you've said, well, no, we're staying together for the kids, knock that off right now. Divorce does not hurt kids. Attorneys and animosity hurt kids. So if you are staying together thinking you're saving your children, that is just factually inaccurate. Um, and we can talk about how do you separate and how do you tell your kids you're separating at whatever age they are in a way that you know is, is helps their maturity, helps their understanding is age appropriate, and also is respectful of you two. You both deserve to have a fulfilling life. So you, you can do that even if you're not together anymore. Nice. Wow. You're such a source of information that I didn't know. It's fascinating. It's really, it's really, it's heartening too, because, you know, you get pessimistic when you, when you look at relationships in America today and you think, my God, things are just falling apart everywhere. But what you're saying is that there's real hope a lot more than we would think. And, and a little bit of, of deeper examination and this, um, I, I hate to call it boot camp, but it's really exciting. Um, you know, in three days, we're going to, we're going to get in there and we're going to get under the hood and figure it out. I think that's just wonderful. It is a boot camp to some extent. And, you know, coming back to this idea of no one's ever taught how to be married. So it makes sense that so many people would be struggling and failing. You know, it's yeah. it's some um, and it's really sad. It, it, it is really sad. And it's it's so amazing to see people come after, you know, the second day of the retreat and to say, wow, I did not think we were going to stick together. And they realized that you know, they were stuck in a dynamic and a cycle for years and years and years. I mean, I worked with couples that haven't had sex in 10 years with each other. Notice I said with each other. <laughs> and um, I mean, there really is hope, you know, and um, so, you know, the general, often what I say to couples is, you know, 50% of couples get divorced. Of the couples that stay together, about 30% of couples report uh, one spouse is unhappy, at least one spouse is unhappy. So 20% of marriages are actually happy and long lasting. Everything that I teach couples is what are those 20% doing and how can you join them? And I always start with the same hypothesis. You just need to learn the skills. Your marriage will be fine. Let's start with that hypothesis. By the end of the second day, we're either going to prove or disprove that hypothesis. And then we can make a decision moving forward. Wow. And we all should have learned those skills in junior high. <laughs> yes, I agree. There's actually a really interesting sex ed curriculum for elementary students, which I think some states in our uh, United States would be very opposed to at this time. However, generally speaking, teaching kids body autonomy at a very early age is really, really important. So, you know, you don't have to teach intercourse to teach sex education. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. I mean, I was thinking about your, your statistics when you mentioned you know, I, I was thinking about pilots even like imagine if we didn't give any pilots training and 50 percent of them landed these big jets without incident. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's like and, the, the marriage thing, like 50 percent divorce. And I like that because now imagine your family are the passengers. I mean, that's what's happening mm -hmm. to all the kids and everyone else that you're supposed to be oh. taking care of. Oh, yeah. And in many cases, your business, if you have a business, you're dragging that whole business along in a, in a rotten marriage. I've seen rotten marriages affect entire businesses and all the employees and their families. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and health, right? We talked about, you know, general health property sleep and how that impacts your marriage. And yeah, it's it's really sad. And I, I feel very fortunate to be able to do this work. And, you know, um, I sort of fell into it because my parents have a very successful couple retreat business. and. I was extremely resistant to doing couples therapy for a long time until I realized that this is not what I thought of as couples therapy. This is really something different. This is coaching. This is supportive work. You know, I, I am not getting into the arguments with them. I'm really holding their hands through a different process. And it's really rewarding. This is alternative couples therapy. I love it. Mm. Me too. David, it's been a joy talking with you. I, I absolutely love your energy. You have you have just a a very energetic and, and sprightly nature about you. And I, I can just imagine that the couples that work with you have a, a renewed sense of, of 
vibrance and livelihood. And so it's not surprising at all that you and your family have this legacy. And I can't wait to come and visit and, and, um, and, and show the world uh, what you do and, and do more of this. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And I, we've been talking about this uh, event, you know, doing something like this together for a while. I'm, I'm glad it finally came together. And I've always been so amazed with your knowledge and background as well. And whenever I've referred someone to you, I say, I just want to caution you. He knows too much. That's my only, <laughs> that's my only, uh, you know, cautionary tale here because it, you're, 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 I mean, subatomical knowledge, quite literally of the human body is just is phenomenal. And um, I wish that, you know, people watching this and, and learning about these topics can just spread it to everybody. You know, a lot of what we're talking about is what I wish I knew in high school, certainly college. Like at some point, some of these fundamentals of relationships and biochemistry, I, I feel like it, it, I mean, we could talk about the educational system in a whole other lecture, but I, I wish people were getting this info. Yeah. Why didn't we learn this stuff in school, David? It, I tell my wife all the time, I, I feel I feel angry, I feel sad when I walk around my property realizing that in order to pass the fifth grade, I needed to know all the state capitals, but they didn't care if I could identify the plants in my backyard. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it has been an absolute joy working with you. This is Dr. David Helfand, and we are signing off. Thank you. Thank you.